Hello, friends. We are excited that our No Small Endeavor Plus community is growing. Now, all of our friends in the No Small Endeavor orbit are intelligent, smarter than average, winsome, good-looking, while the members of NSC Plus seem especially so because they are enjoying ad-free episodes as well as special subscriber-only content once a month where we discuss habits and practices learned from our guests over the years. And those special episodes have been a lot of fun, personal and practical. I love sitting down with our producer, Jacob Lewis, and recording those for you. And so we would love to have you join us. And your NSC Plus membership helps support the show. So because of all of these things, we'd love for you to join the NSC Plus family. Just go to nosmallendeavor.com, click subscribe, and start catching up on our subscriber-only episodes today. Again, go now, nosmallendeavor.com, click subscribe, and start catching up. See you there. Hello, friends. You're listening to No Small Endeavor. I'm Lee C. Camp. This is our unabridged interview with Tom and Tony Bancroft. Tom and Tony are twin brothers, and they are lifetime animators. Between the two of them, 60 years of experience or so in the animation industry. They've worked as artists for Disney, Warner Brothers, DreamWorks, and more. For many years now, I've been fascinated with hearing how artists think of their work and how they think of how they frame what it is that they're seeking to do in the world. Fascinating to hear Tom and Tony talk about the ways in which they slowly emerged and evolved to thinking of their work in animation as being storytellers that's engaging with the notion of character and character formation. They've got a lot of remarkable stories to tell. A lovely, this was a lovely interview and it's good to hear uh, two brothers talk about the ways in which their own envy and uh, competition with one another made them better at what they do. Hope you enjoy. Tom and Tony Bancroft, twin brothers. Between them, more than something like 60 years in animation, production, directing, and more. They've both been employed full-time by Disney. Between them, have worked with Sony Entertainment, Warner Brothers, Big Idea Productions, DreamWorks, and many more. Their credits together or separately include Mulan, The Return of Mary Poppins, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Pocahontas, and many more. They host together the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast, and currently they are both colleagues of mine at Lipscomb University here in Nashville, Tennessee. Welcome, Tom and Tony. Hey, hey. thank you. It's great to be it's here. A How are you doing, Lee? I'm good. I'm good here. You know, I'm on sabbatical here currently, and so I, Ooh, how could I not how do we be get, good? How do we yeah. get that gig? You're I'm a little have, jealous. You're going to have to slave away in the salt mines of academia a little longer. <laughs> and you, uh, is that how that, Tony, yeah. That's, that's right. how it works. That's right, yeah. Well, here, here's the, here's just for your listeners. Tony and I are artists in residence, so we will never qualify oh. for tenure or yeah. probably sabbaticals. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, that doesn't seem quite right to me. We're here for the love. You're here for the love you. of it. You're for the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why we get into yeah, academia. Right. So animation, why animation? How would you say that animation has become a sort of pursuit of your life's work? So we'll start. Let's see. I think, Tony, you said that Tom is the firstborn. Yes, the Tom twins. is first. Yes. That's but, so true. Let's start. Three, by three minutes. Let's, so he can start. He can minutes. talk for three no, minutes. Let's start. And then let's I'll turn the in. tables. And start with the second born, Tony. Oh, how, yeah. Okay. How how animation? Why animation? Why, why animation? The big why. Yeah. I mean, Tom and I were bit by the animation bug kind of later in our artistic journey. We started out loving to draw, and it was kind of a way of how we impressed our mom, I guess, to get her favor. <laughs> single mom. We were raised by a single mom, and so when she would come home from work, we were there waiting at the door with drawings, saying, huh. "Which one's better? Pick one." <laughs> you know? um, and it's I true. think everything was a contest when we were younger. You know, and we were. Tom and I have always been close to drawing, just loving the craft of drawing and storytelling. Grew up with comic strips, Charles Schultz, The Peanuts and all that. You know, that was our go-to. Didn't discover animation and bit by that bug until we went to a city college uh, for a little bit while we were trying to figure out our next path through academia or what we needed to learn because we were going to do a comic strip. We were huh. just dead set on just being a published syndicated comic strip. And working together on a, we had a twin strip, believe it or not, huh. about two twins, very original. Um, <laughs> and that wasn't going anywhere, but we discovered animation while we were at that city college. We got, and uh, Tony, we didn't give it enough off. of a chance, Gil and Gary. That was their Gil and Gary. Gary. And, Gary. Yes. and yeah, so it was clever yes. how it was similar to our names. I'm glad we didn't give it a chance, but, Tom, because I don't think that say, was going to go anywhere. <laughs> I'm going to dig into this. So it's for the artists that are listening, you know, it really was a golden age 
of creativity. I think if anybody wants to think back of all the things that dropped during the, and I'm going to say late seventies, all the way through most of the eighties, because we graduated high school in 1985, by the way. And so, and we weren't into Cal arts until like, well, yeah, 1988 or so 87. And so during that time, yeah, he mentioned peanuts, but that was an older strip, right? That started in the fifties. But if you really think about the 80s and comic strips world, that was like, okay, then Far Side, then uh, Calvin and Hobbes dropped. I mean, like some major, really high end, creative, well done comic strips. This sort of second golden age of comic strips happened in the early 80s. And then, likewise, on TV, well, not very good on TV. It was all trash TV pretty much when, it, when you talk about <laughs> Saturday morning cartoons. But there was that, it was a boom time of animation. I will say that. And they weren't really good, high quality, but it was like Super Friends and things like that. Meanwhile, comic books, 1985 is known as the golden year of comics. It was it was when major things dropped, like the the Dark Knight Returns and things like that. Frank Miller and John Byrne, there was like a major influx there in comic books too. We were into all of those huh. things. Oh, Mad Magazine, of course. That yeah. was 70s and 80s. Yeah. That was another huge influence for us. It was so, a golden age and of And by the way, I'm going to back this up. Now on the film site, 1977, Star Wars comes out. So Boom. Like, that's really what started <laughs> it. We, we, huh. we don't mention this a lot, but a lot of our love for film happened right then and there huh. with Star Wars. But we were just the artist side of that. Yeah. So anyway, all of those things kind of led to us being here today. Yeah. So briefly, how, how would you say that competition between two twin brothers has played or not played into what you've ended up doing or how you've done it? Well, I think, you know, the Bible says iron sharpens iron. And I think we say that about our competitiveness it hasn't always been friendly. But, <laughs> right. um, but that, impli do, that implies that, that both of us are, are iron. <laughs> <laughs> and at times you maybe felt a little weaker than iron and you were just getting like run over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we certainly wouldn't go for the Iron Man, you know, uh, run. But I, I will say that I do think we were very competitive in that we would go over each other's drawings I and mean, we would literally work in the same room. We always shared a room together yeah. and we had these, you know, overbearing large art desks in, in one room plus bunk beds huh. and plus, you know, a study area. So growing up, we were in tight spaces. Um, literally and, back to back, right? Back to back. <laughs> and we could literally look over each other's shoulders huh. and, you know, oh, don't do that. Try this or, you know, or draw over each other's drawings. We, when we were doing comics, you know, one of us would pencil the drawings uh, and, and just sketch out the characters and stuff and the word balloons. And then the other one would follow up by inking it and huh. putting it into, you know, a darker black line. Uh, and that's kind of how we worked and back and forth and back and forth, always going over each other's work. And, and it's funny to us now to be teaching and teaching the next generation of animators and stuff. And they're coming out of high school. They're brand new to that whole critique side of things. And we're like, Tony and I, you, you couldn't, draw in secret in our room it yeah. was so small and so we were constantly critiquing each other yeah. and so it's it wasn't always pleasant like it got worse probably at the end of high school the competitiveness got a little negative but definitely it is true that yeah. we kind of were pushing each other how, how did you end up navigating getting out of it being negative Ooh, I think, question. you know, I think it's a lifelong, <laughs> yeah. a lifelong thing for Tom. Have and we? I tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I think about it all the time. I'm just like, you know, am I, am I too competitive with Tom is, you know, I, a long time ago, and I would say like midway through working at Disney, because we haven't gotten to that, but we both worked at Disney feature animation for a while. Tom was in Florida and I was in California. And so even though we were like, you know, 5,000 miles apart from each other, there was still a competitiveness. We would we would be working on the same films, like literally Beauty and the Beast. Tom was in Florida working on, on that, doing some animation. I'm doing different animation on the same film, just in a different area or sequence. And 
we're calling each other up on the phone all the time and mm. talking about what we're doing. And there's kind of a, there was always kind of a one upness of like, Oh, I got this scene of Cogsworth and he's doing this and he's <laughs> saying this and it's really cool. And Tom's like, Oh, I got another crowd scene. And you know, they're really small yeah. and singing kill the beast and it's no fun. <laughs> and I'm, oh, I'm, you yeah. know, I'm bored and I'm like, you got to get out here. This is where everything's happening. And, you know, and, and that put a pressure on Tom to like, you know, am I going to move out to California to be part of, you know, kind of the, the yeah, main Tony, studio? During that time, Tony was relentlessly <laughs> trying to get me to move to California, <laughs> basically saying you're, you're hurting your career. And he wasn't 100% wrong and I knew it. But also I had a wife that loved Florida and we had bought a house and uh, bought a house. <laughs> I said, my kids say that same thing. I don't know where they get that from. <laughs> I, I wonder where they get it from. Yeah, <laughs> bought uh, But anyway, we, we had a life. We were just starting to have kids and things like that. And, and it was a really hard time. It was probably the hardest time of my life was those early years at Disney. And Tony made it so much worse <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> because I would come home and I'd be like, I'd tell him no, no, no. And then I'd go home and I'd be like, babe, I kind of think we need to be moving. Huh. And, you know, I would just repeat everything he yeah. said. And, and so I'd play devil's advocate on one side and then kind of opening up the truth of my feelings at home. And anyway, it was something we had to go through myself. I had to go through and realize the importance of my family yeah. too, though. Yeah. But I mean, to my defense, I guess being a twin. Oh, uh, there's no is, defense. Okay. Okay. I feel like I need a little defense, <laughs> but I mean, it is different being a twin. Cause I, I, I always felt like Tom and I knew each other so well, we had all the same interests ever since like day one coming out of the womb. We, we loved the same things, did the same things. We're always together. So when it came to our art, drawing i knew that tom could do better because i felt like i could do better and huh. so i felt like he wasn't being pushed enough or or pushing himself enough i guess and i think that's where a lot of my urging of you got to get out here because obviously it would have made us more competitive if he was out in burbank california with me at the main disney studios we would have been vying for yeah. probably a lot Careful of the same what work. you wish for Tony. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and I, so, but I also felt like together we were stronger because we had that experience of always working and going over each other's work and stuff like that, that I felt like together we were stronger. And I felt like Tom was kind of missing out. I wanted him to have what I was having. And I, and I do feel like it was a, time of milk and honey yeah. for me out there well, in it's, California. It's, it's one of those class it's like one of those classic things from Aristotle about the the virtue being a mean between two vices, you know, with the the competition there you you've you've pointed to the ways in which it was immensely helpful and the ways it could be very negative and uh finding that sweet spot of too little yeah. to too much. Yeah. Is the, Aristotle, you, your mention Aristotle went right over my head. But if Daffy Duck said that, I would have recognized that quote. Right, right. Yeah, put on a little lisp when you yeah. say it, and that'll help. Uh, yeah, but and you're right. Like, thank you for this therapy session. But you know, <laughs> Tony's not wrong in that. There's a there's an element of it. I'd say we we you know it's sort of I guess I don't want to equate it to alcoholism. I guess, but it is that sort of like you have to live with it yeah. right so tony and i are living with that competition it's not it's always there to some degree it's just you know can we control it can we keep the selfishness abided right so let me turn to notions about creative process and there's actually a interesting number of papers and studies out on the relationship between arts and human flourishing creativity and positive emotional effect creativity as a means toward or intrinsic activity in human flourishing and the like. And mm. so when I was thinking about talking with you guys, I thought, I, w I wonder in what ways you've experienced your work as sort of intrinsic to living a good life. And one other possible angle into this is that talking about Aristotle, point to him again, you know, when he talked about the, the, the point of life is what the Greek word was eudaimonia, which is a sort of state of pleasure or blessedness. And there's been other sorts of psychological studies that have suggested that maybe what Aristotle was pointing to is found in this so-called flow state, and that when you work on something intensely and you get in a state of flow, it's this deeply pleasurable experience. And they've even done like brain studies where they've, they've looked at the ways in which blood flow to the parts of the brain that are aware of time gets decreased. So that's why you mm. can be in the middle of something and think, where did those two hours go? Um, oh, for sure. So, so what, what's kind of been your experience as far as pleasure, happiness, 
being in a state of flow with regard to your creativity? What's that looked like for you? And and I feel like you're saying like the the zone. We probably yeah, yeah. call it the creative zone, right. right? Yeah. Does it feel true to you that this is an element of a genuinely flourishing human life to to kind of cultivate these times of being in the zone? Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. it's I think it is unique to creatives too that like Tom was saying the zone that you get into. But when you're talking about just pleasure or bliss or a feeling of almost transcendence, I think that is what kind of happens. And Tom and I talk about this quite a bit, that there is that, we call it the zone. But when you get into that very creative work mode, you kind of go somewhere else. And it is really pleasant and it's intoxicating. And it is, you know, I, I as Christians, I think Tom and I would probably compare it more to a, a spiritual feeling of bliss and blessing, like you were kind of saying, Lee, because it I, I think we do feel a, an underlying sense of the gifts and abilities that God has given us in the way of drawing is just that a gift. And at times it almost feels like a superpower that we can do that very few people seem to be able to do. And therefore there is some, kind of a sense of feeling special or, or finding that place is really a connection point with God who gave us these gifts. And I think, um, I don't know. That's that's how I would talk about it, I guess. Tom, well, what do you and think? Let's, yeah, I agree with all that. But let's take it to the other side of that, which is, you know, artist block. Right. We have so many people that follow mm. us online and I get this this at this question all the time. How do you deal with artist block? And it's just the same as writer's block. It's that idea that I can't just sit down and draw right now, even though I have a deadline or whatever. It's my job for the day. It's not coming out right. All right. I'm uh, something is in yeah. the way and it, and it's because I don't have that flow or at least it implies that. And I, Tony and I don't really believe in artist block because we sort of, it's one of those things where we just say, well, we don't allow it. Right. When you, when you're a professional artist and I would say this is probably true for prof professional musicians and things like that, there's days they probably as a guitarist get into the groove or, or that are moments. Right. And they're just like, again, that time flies and they're just doing their best work and it's hopefully you're recording and all that. But, you know, with, and that's true. There's, there's days or times that I feel like I'm more in the groove, more in the flow. I'm able to draw better ideas are coming to me. And, you know, it, that creative flow that we're talking about is happening. And then there's days where it, it kind of is a job and I have to sit down and just, I have to draw this one thing today because this is the deadline for this job and I don't feel like it, but I have to get into it. And, and then you just have to tap into, there's all these processes, yeah. I guess you could say, and deadline is one of those processes, but it's a big one of just going, okay, but I have to. And so therefore do I get a little inspired? I, my Instagram is like a gallery show. I, maybe I'll scroll there and just see the artists that I follow and, and see some of the work that they're posting. And that got, might get me pumped. I have art books, you know, that I can maybe start with and just get pumped and, and get in that yeah. flow, get, get excited about yeah. drawing. Yeah. It does that. Uh, I don't remember where I've heard this, but you know, the line about follow your passion. And then on the other hand, someone saying following your passion is terrible advice. If the sense is that you have to wait until you feel like doing the creative work, right. Instead there are those times where, and, you know, my experience in writing, for example, is that I have to sit down and start doing the work, whether I feel like it or not. And then sometimes yeah. when I've gotten myself into doing the work, an hour in, I might have this eureka moment that feels blissful. But if I wait for the eureka or blissful moment to start, a lot of times I, I, I might not ever get there. And it's, it's kind of sitting down and doing the work. I, I find like that's the best way to get there anyway, Lee, is I think you, I've never been able to like kind of sit down and get into the zone or find that blissful moment immediately. I feel like you have to kind of find it by, by searching it out, you know, and, and in that way, it's, it's kind of like when you sit down to read God's word, I feel like there's that, you know, at first it, it's just words on paper and you're just kind of processing it. But then as you process it, you start to discover truths that apply to your life. And as you start to discover truths that apply to your life, then you start to see God working in your life. And one thing happens after another. And it is a process of, of finding that zone and that place, I think, of bliss. And we do it, you know, we, we talk about it through drawing a lot of times, but 
it can relate to a lot of things yeah. for everybody. So how has, in the process of your life's work, how has failure been important to you? Mm, that's a great one. We we did a podcast. We're podcasters, too. We had the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast, for those that want to check it out. But but a few years ago, I kind of went to Tony and I said, let's do a different podcast today. Like Because every once in a while, we usually interview people in the industry, directors and animators and, and people like that, voice talent. But but every once in a while, or or every third episode, we'll we'll do what we call a hash it out, where we just get on and it's just Tony and I, and we just talk about the industry or things that are going on in our lives. And in this one, I, I said, let's do one about failure. Let's be honest with our with our listeners and talk about our lives and the failures. I think we call it failures and flubs and uh, frustrations, failures, and frustrations. frustrations and flubs, yeah, something like that. And talk about just that not every day life is perfect. And it was sort of, it was inspired by a post I saw on Facebook, somebody saying, you know, all I see here is everybody's high notes, you know, yeah, when right. they, when they post. And, you know, I'd really like us to be honest more on Facebook and things like that. And I was like, okay, I took that and ran with it for that podcast. And it's still one of the probably top 10 ones that we hear about that mm. podcast from our listeners, because they've said how much that helped them you know, hearing two industry people that have been doing it for 30 years kind of saying, you know what, there was this story, here's this story of, of a failure. So yeah, I, I a hundred percent believe in failure. I don't like it. <laughs> I, I could still say that, but boy, yeah, you learn from it. And you know, every, everybody always, I'm going to back into this last bit, this last little mini story, which is through the years when I was at Disney, people would ask like, how many drawings does it take? to make an, a Disney animated film. And I think the short answer was always like, oh, about a million, right? Like Disney kind of did a quick calculation. I think they just wanted to have an answer. Yeah. And so I would say, you know, it's about a million. But by the way, for every drawing that's in the movie, there's probably three to five that were thrown away. Mm. And so really, if you want that answer, it's it's five million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or a billion. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, and that really is, that is that every day, every drawing failure that makes you hopefully the the best version of yourself. And, uh, yeah, and so the art world, learning. and it's something that we, we're hopefully always learning because we're always dealing with failure. I think Tom and I both really connect with our students because we feel like failures oftentimes too at our craft, at, at this drawing thing. We feel like, what's the term? Imposters, mm. you know, the imposter syndrome thing that a lot of students talk about. We still feel that way. You mm. know, we still feel like imposters a lot of times. I still sit down to draw, even though I love it. And I love getting in that zone we were talking about. Oftentimes I'll make drawings, a lot of drawings that are just mistakes or, or horrible or, you know, things that I wouldn't even show, certainly not Tom, but, but even my mom. <laughs> and uh, bef before I start making things that, I, that I'm, I'm actually happy with, and even I put stuff out there that I'm not 100% happy with because, and I'll say that in sometimes in my social media postings of like, well, here's one, you know, and without much uh, fanfare, you know, this is, here's one, I'm not totally happy with it, but here it is, you know, yeah. I just want to post that and share that. And I think people really connect with that too. If you can share your honest feelings about, I wouldn't call it a mistake. I would just say that we don't always create brilliance. And, and I know for myself, I can be real hit and miss when it comes to the excellence yeah. that I see in front of me that I, that I, yeah. that I want to achieve. I can be real hit and miss. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore, you can either look at yourself as a constant failure or you can look at yourself as somebody that's just growing and learning and always trying to achieve excellence. Yeah. In but their Tony, work. sometimes when you post that, your trash is somebody else's treasure. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Not mine. It's like, it's like I a look yard at sale. It. <laughs> I mean, I look at it and I go, that's crappy. Why did he post that? But yeah. <laughs> no, but for somebody else, you might have lifted them up. So anyway, that's Lee, true. I yeah. mean, yeah, I think my I think of my Instagram page as uh, a yard sale, basically. Uh, <laughs> so come come find what you want. Maybe it's here. Well, I, you know, I love the, the the language of excellence is so much more helpful than the language of perfection, right? So ex excellence is, can always say, well, the the failures or the stuff that's not where you want it to yet is part of the process of striving for excellence, and yet perfectionism can kill excellence mm. because it just is debilitating, I think, to us. And then also reminded me of a, of a line about, I think the whoever this was, was talking about writing. But 
said that, you know, in, in, in doing a piece of writing, you, you never get it perfect. You just get to a good stopping place. And I found that yeah. super helpful. You know, it's like, if I get to a really good stopping place, then, well, that's a good stopping place. Well, that's so uh, true yeah. of drawing too. You know, like, when am I done? Right. You know, yeah. I could keep picking at this drawing or this painting or, you know, and then add and add and add. And there's a, that is part of the art is yeah. knowing when, when to, to stop. stop. Stop yeah. touching it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about with the with the success you all have had, and then being in a world of other very successful people in your industry? How have you learned to deal with envy? Mm. Mm. Wow, Tony, how how are you doing with that envy? With me? <laughs> <laughs> How's that going? <laughs> well, yeah. I I mean, that is my first thought. Is that I think Tom and I that goes along with our competitiveness is is a feeling of like. Oh, wow. Look what he just did. I don't know if I'll ever be able to draw that well or do that, that thing that he just did in that same kind of quality level. So there, I, I, I do point to Tom as probably being the artist that I'm most envious of on a constant day to day basis. And yet our Instagrams are, we talk about Instagram a lot because like, like Tom said earlier, it is a, a point of connection with the art world and our, our Instagram pages and the people that we follow are almost a hundred percent artists. So I go there just like Tom was saying earlier. And, and I look at what other people are doing in the industry of, you know, comics and animation and things like that. And I'm inspired on one, one hand and then envious and jealous of opportunities and successes that I see there in the other hand, you know, and I can think of an artist I just saw yesterday, as a matter of fact, and I was so filled. My first emotion was envy of like, oh man, look at that. Look what he did there. And I, I can never, you know, cross hatch like that or something like that. It's Bobby Chu. I was thinking of Tom. I know exactly uh, who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw that and, post too, Tony. <laughs> I know. And I was just so like, weeping. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my gosh, how does he do that? How could I? And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm at older age here in my life here. So Much I older. can't expect that I'm going to, I, I, I can't expect that I'll ever achieve that goal of what he's doing. And so I'm left with this feeling of envy immediately that comes to me of like, I'll never be able to get there because of where I'm at. And, and it, earlier in my life, so I still struggle with that because earlier in my life, I would, I would go, I would be envious to go, okay, well, that's a goal now. That's a goal to try and transcend to and work hard towards. But where I'm at now, it's like, I don't think I'll ever get there. And that's kind of disappointing. Yeah, it's in funny, some ways. I tell, I tell my students, I'm like, if you're envious and you're like in your twenties and all that, of all the artists that are above you that you're looking up toward and everything, guess, guess how bad that feels when you're like 55 <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're half your age and you know, you're never going to get there. Cause it's, it's already kind of too late. <laughs> so, so enjoy that envy. Yeah. No. And, and just to back up what Tony said, I, I really feel like, yeah, I, I actually envy less the the people on Instagram, the other artists in my life because of Tony, because I, all my envy just has been with him. <laughs> and that's sort of, again, the sort of the higher mark, I guess, that we're, we're both trying to hit because we both are, while we're identical and we have all the same artist, artistic influences and basically draw on all the same stuff, even we're both good at slightly, we did kind of go off on a little bit different you know, tangents within the art and within what we draw and animate, you know, where I do things that are a little bit more anatomical, a little bit more humans, I would say more is my, my hot spot. And Tony likes to draw kind of cartoony animals. He's more on the cartoony mm -hmm. side. And so we do kind of, you know, go out, diverge a little bit. Yeah. On, in thinking about fueling creativity, maybe, Real quickly, just two or three habits or practices that you have that help fuel creativity. Tom, I, Tom, I think you, or I'm not sure if Tom or Tony, one of you mentioned having art books you look back at in, yeah, in your Instagram sweet. accounts. But what are what are other kind of things that help keep you fueled creatively? You know, I'm going to throw out one that we don't always talk about, which is is that human part, which is going to conventions, going to getting out. And, you know, COVID had a lot of nastiness that came with it. And one of the bigger ones was that, that, you know, I don't want to say human touch, but that human connection, you know, connection. Yeah. And so, and artistically, especially you think, 
as an artist, we, we tend to be in hidden in our little room and working by ourselves. And it, and it, and it is, that is about 90% of the job it feels like, but that makes that other, you know, 10 or so 20% of that time where you're, you need to get out and be with people and feed off their creativity verbally too. And just personality wise and kind of enriching your life too, but also literally going outside and taking a walk, you know, during COVID that was like how we all survived just on walks with our spouses or loved ones to get outside and just, it was the only safe thing we could kind of do. And, you know, that, that was how I grew as an artist. I still need to do that. When I hit that sort of block, that artist block I mentioned before, yeah, I'll go to an art book, but if the smartest thing I can do is just go outside and kind of, and really faith wise too, commune with Christ and the things that he's created, that bigger picture of kind of stepping out of my own life. You do that naturally. I think when you go outside and just take a walk and take a break. It's retreat, you know, and I think that's uh, very valuable for the creative artists is to retreat into nature. I can't say enough. And it doesn't matter. You know, we draw silly cartoons a lot of times, Daffy Duck or Bugs Bunny and things like that and Disney films and stuff. And yet I still find myself really energized. I just came back from a trip to Kona, Hawaii, and and I just being there on the shore and sitting on the beach and with my sketchbook, because I'll always have my sketchbook with me, but I'll draw people that are just, you know, standing around or going into the water or, you know, lying there on their towels or something or talking to each other. And to me, that's a huge challenge. And it's also very inspiring. And then just being in nature, like Tom was saying, that's, that's the thing. That's the you know, you kind of need a reset sometimes. And I feel like any kind of retreat into nature, into somewhere else is the best thing to, to reset. So what I just heard, Tony, not to belittle that, but that you like to sit on the, on the beach and draw half naked people. (laughs) Did you hear that? And that's how you commune. (laughs) Yeah. Is that Maybe that tells us a lot more about Tom than it does about you. Yeah, I think it does. (laughs) Yeah, I think it does. (laughs) What I I heard, Tony, was I have never thought of the etymology of the word retreat until you were the way you, something about the way you said it, because we always think of retreat, you know, the denotation of it being pulling away, but to retreat to know mm-hmm. again the treat of being in the world or being in nature yeah. or whatever, you know, that's a- Is that that's what a, you said? I was zoning uh, out. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You heard did what you, you heard. Yeah. You just, Thank you, Lee, for did hearing you just properly. Teach Lee something? <laughs> I, that's that. I did not see coming. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the art of storytelling, we haven't talked about that yet. I remember years ago going to a, a session with a, a guy who's a movie writer in New York and spending three or four days listening to him talk about storytelling in a thing in Times Square. And I was fascinated by the way this guy talked about all story as fundamentally moral in nature, which, which of course also fits with the virtue traditions because in the virtue traditions, storytelling is one of the primary practices by which moral formation occurs, that you give exemplars, you give counter exemplars, and moreover, it can specify the particularities of particular virtues. So for example, courage for the Greco-Roman culture hero was seen primarily in battle, whereas courage for the early church, for example, was seen primarily in the willingness to face martyrdom, which are two very different things but they were also the way they, they painted, they told different stories, right? And their different stories filled out a different vision of what courage might mean. So the art and the importance of storytelling. How have you thought about storytelling in your own work? Well, I'll, st- I'll start by just saying, I, you know, for me, it's funny because we were so influenced by just drawing funny pictures and characters when we were younger that for me, I didn't really think of myself as a storyteller until I was well into several years, maybe five years at Disney. And then I started realizing people would talk about themselves and, and as us in animation as storytellers. And I was like, oh, oh, I guess I am. I mean, I'm drawing these characters and they're relating to a larger story. But for some reason, I didn't put that together. And now I, I define myself as a storyteller first and foremost, because that is what we do in, in animation and our, all of our animation that we've 
per, uh, you know, produced at, at any of the bigger studios or even our personal animation has always been about driving a story and communicating a story to a larger audience. And to me, that's, that's the true calling. I feel like both Tom and I share as being Christians in the entertainment industry is that we are storytellers and just like Jesus Christ used story to be relevant with the community that he was speaking to at the day and time that he was doing that. We, we do that on a larger, a large scale through cinema, through the, the stories that we make, through the movies that we make. And it, and then there's a, a something that you said too really sparked with me too, Lee, because you know in in Hollywood storytelling, Western storytelling for movies, there's a great lineage to Joseph Campbell. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Joseph Campbell. He's the one that kind of did a study all around the world, all around you know, and and different cultures, and discovered that we all have ways of understanding story and story as a vehicle for communicating larger truths. And in the Disney, Disney has adapted that into what we call themes. And there's thematics that we ad- adhere to or, or apply to rather to all of our stories. So Beauty and the Beast is one that, you know, is an example of a theme, which is don't judge a book by its cover. Right. And that's the lesson learned that Bell achieves through the journey of that story. And we talk about that constantly in, in the movies that we make. What is the theme of it? What is the, the bigger truth that we're sharing with our, our audience? And therefore, that's the truth that the, the main character goes on. The hero's journey is about finding that truth and somehow changing on, on the other side of it. Jesus did that with his stories, too, um, when he was you know, talking about different characters or farmers or you know, seeds that are growing and things that were really relative to the community then he was able to apply larger truths about how we should live, how we should be, how we should love each other in, in his storytelling. And I feel like we, we do a lot of the same things. So for Tom and I to be able to connect from a Christian standpoint to what Christ did and the example that he set through his storytelling has, I think, helped us be more impactful in the career choice that we have. Uh, yeah, I want to add to that, and but take a different skew to it. So that was, that was well said, Tony. Nice job. But... Uh, and, and it's mindset. And I, I want to kind of speak to the your listeners that are creatives, that are artists, especially, because Tony's right, we went into this not thinking of ourselves as storytellers, or but especially writers. And now both of us have written books and things like that, which is just still amazing to me. But because because of that, why that was, was as an artist, you kind of, you think, okay, I'm this, uh, you kind of, it's labels, right? You know, I'm this, and this is how I use my creativity. I express it through drawing or through this, you know, these images I'm creating or these characters I'm designing. And so my entry point into animation, but also just drawing has always been character focused. I love drawing characters. And what I didn't realize was what made me love those characters was the writing, some of the words that would like their personalities that were being, you know, crafted into the stories that they were a part of, even, you know, the Peanuts comic strip way back when that we loved and, you know, who Snoopy is and all that. It wasn't just his design. That was probably the entry point for us. But as we grew in love for that character, it was through the story, of course. And so, and I'll relate this back to a story, which is, I took a bunch of our students, animation students years ago, we went to California, we did like a, a, you know, like a field trip and went to California and I'd, I'd set up all these meetings at different studios. So we were at Nickelodeon studios and taking a tour and the person giving us that tour was Butch Hartman. He's the creator of Fairly Odd Parents and a lot of shows for Nickelodeon, Danny Phantom. And he was gracious enough to give us that tour. And at the end of the tour, it kind of put us in a little conference room and we had a little Q&A with him. And he was super gracious with his time. And he said, all right, he, he wanted to know, you know about the students too. And he said, okay, so everybody raise your hand if, if you consider yourself a writer also. I know you're an artist, but can, raise your hand if you feel like you're a writer also. And I'd say we had at least 10 people there, students, and one or two of them like halfway put up their arm, you know, one of those like things, kind of. And and even I, I don't know if I raised my hand or not at that time. And, I, and I'd written a book already, by the way. Um, and, so, and so he said, no, wrong. All of you are writers and you need to just claim this right now because even though you may not write it down on a, on a piece of paper or, you know, type something out, whatever, 
you are a writer because as you're developing your worlds and you're creating your personalities for the characters you're drawing in your sketchbooks, most of the time, you're probably also writing little descriptive words of who they are and what their personality is. You're formulating stories constantly as you draw, as you, if anything character driven, you are creating stories behind that character. And so you need to now just go to the next level with that and accept that, yes, you're a writer also. And by the way, maybe even start writing scripts because that's what Butch had done. He, he became the head show writer for his shows, even though he started as an artist, just designing the weird, crazy looking characters. He said, I, I had to become a writer and kind of train myself to do that so that I could help shape those stories into the shows that I wanted them to be. Otherwise I'd be giving that job to somebody else, but I knew these characters and stories better than anybody. Yeah. Why aren't I writing them? That's really interesting. It, it reminds me, you know, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, they'll speak when they're, when they're drawing icons, they'll, they'll speak of it in terms of writing icons. And I've always found that interesting and intriguing that they refer to it that way. And a, another thing that occurred to me as y'all were sharing is the whole notion of a character I mean, that's obviously a significant word in moral philosophy. And in moral philosophy, a character, one's character is, is kind of the sum of one's dispositions, the sum of one's habitual tendencies, the skills, habits, dispositions. One has some of the virtues and the vices. And so it's interesting to think about with you all drawing characters. Do you have in your mind as you're drawing a character what we mean by character in moral philosophy, that you're thinking about habits, dispositions, virtues, vices of that particular character that you're drawing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, for sure. Yeah, and, you know, we teach character design class at Lisbon University as part of the animation curriculum. And in character design and in animation, we, you know, it, we always talk about, you know, show it, don't say it, right? Mm. In our storytelling for animation, we try and make it very visual. That makes it universal. We don't have to translate as much. The more we can do through, you know, characters just reacting or getting some acting from in a theatrical way through their expressions and stuff like that. That's what we try to achieve. And that goes back to, so when you talk about characters, we have what we call character archetypes, um, and that goes back to Commedia dell'arte uh, and the study of, you know, street performers and how they created masks that they put on. And they would ex the same actor would portray multiple characters in a play by just putting on a different mask and then therefore hitting a different stance or a pose. And they would become that persona. And, uh, and those archetypes. And it was back, very back formulaic in day, back in those days, too. Right. There were like these five to seven archetypes. And, and so people would know as soon as they put into that, got onto that mode, that pose and all that, like a wider stance, they became, you know, but if they're more introverted and they be, take on a, a, like a more enclosed kind of a stance and the personality that went with that, it was, they were all doing it, you know, kind of copying each other, I guess you could say, but that is the heart of character design too. Like we have to know what are these, you know, if you could say the, like, what are the five words that describe your character? which is hard enough to do as human beings, but to do it, you know, for your characters, yeah. then I can now do apply design principles, you know, and posing and expressions, those three things to create a performance for that character. Yeah. Fascinating. So speaking of characters, how do you, how have you thought about relocating to the Bible belt and what, what are, <laughs> what are some of the stock <laughs> characters of Bible belt experience that have intrigued you, frustrated you, or pleased you? Oh, I, I just met one the other day at the gas station. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that's the one thing about being, you know, cartoonist, but also in animation is we're people watchers, uh, Tom and I, and we sketch, like I said, when I went on vacation just last week, I was sketching people. That's how we kind of take in different character types, you know, um, than just our family around us is we're always looking and watching different personalities. How do they pose? How do they stand? Uh, what are their proportions like and things like that? And we caricaturize those things in our animation. And so, yeah, 
big differences, uh, I would say. I've only been here in Tennessee now, living here. I just purchased a house about eight months ago and moved out here about eight months ago. But before that, 100% born and raised in California. Tom was born in, in California too, but been out here a lot longer than I have. And so for me, it's been quite a transition, I will say, you know, from just from politics to, and as a Christian in particular, I was very close, you know, I was right in the, the hub in the middle of the entertainment world, Hollywood, USA, you know, and so, I, and I'm in the film academy and all this kind of stuff. So I go to parties and get togethers and meetings and stuff like that. I'm surrounded by entertainment folks. Well, as a Christian, those are some of the darkest people to talk to. There's there's a lot of selfishness, a lot of revolving around money, their thoughts, their patterning for how they feel about life is very secular. And so it could be a real dark place, I would say, for a Christian. So being out here now as a Christian, holy cow. I mean, it's just been like day and night. I, I literally said to my wife the other day, you know, the other day when we went to Starbucks, we experienced something that we'd never seen before, which was a couple praying at a at a booth next to us, at a table next to us. And you just wouldn't see that in California. And so that cultural change alone, people talking about their faith, openly praying or talking about God in their lives, that's something that, you know, in 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 the movie world, in the industry of Hollywood, you keep it under a bush. And that's not what God wants from us. So there is a freedom, I feel like, for me, it, that's been the biggest change. Yeah, there's personalities and what I call hicks and stuff like that that, that I see around me um, that are that are fun to make fun of. But more watch than it, anything, watch it, Tom. I know, I know. Watch that's it. actually that's actually some of our family yeah. members. Um, uh, but have you yeah. heard Lee's little accent there. Oh boy, uh, I've already got a drawing going of Lee. Um, but yeah, but for a Christian, it, I guess that's the biggest game changer for me in, in coming out here to Tennessee has been. Just Boy, the, and I'll, I'll double down on that to say I've been, yes, I've been out of California now longer than I lived there probably. So since I was about 21, got married, but moved to Florida and I was at the Florida Disney studio. And, but that was a real melting pot of the South. Like we had a lot of people from the South that were working out of that studio. Very few, the Californians were actually a minority in that studio, which was awesome. I, I, I discovered, I, so I wasn't a big part of the entertainment culture as much as Tony was for so many years because it, we didn't have it there. We were in entertainment, but it, it was all about family. And that's what you talked about was your kids more and things like that. And that kind of drove us to not be so we were driven as artists and in our career, like we've talked about before, but, but the motivation behind it was a little bit, I'd like to say a little bit more driven to, toward our family. Anyway, but my what my opening time was about Christianity and faith in my animation career was I left Disney in 2000. It's a long story, but I felt called to leave and to join Big Idea Productions and and help them with VeggieTales. They were going to make their first feature film and this was back in 2003 and I gave up a really top spot on the next film which was Lilo and Stitch and I had just been a supervising animator of Mushu the Dragon in Mulan. And so I was really kind of at the top of my career at Disney and I just left and I went to go to this tiny little studio in Chicago, but it was such an eye opener right away is that they, I'd never been to a company where they said, okay, we're not a Christian company, but we're making Christian content. And they, why they would delineate that is they would say, you know, yeah, we want you to be on brand. I think is how they called it basically that you had to sort of, believe in what we're trying to accomplish, but you didn't have to be a Christian to work there is what they were saying. And there's some legal reasons why they would say that too. But in general, most everybody was a Christian. And if they weren't, they were <laughs> Christian adjacent. I don't know how you want to put that, but they were <laughs> certainly pro what we were trying to accomplish. And, and so we would pray in the meetings. Like we would open up a, a meeting with a prayer. And the first time that happened, because here I am at Big Idea and immediately they're opening meetings with prayers, almost every meeting. And I was like, this is weird. This is bizarre. <laughs> and I'm a believer. I'm a, I am I love God and, and the Lord. And I was already, uh, you know, church, uh, I'd gone to church for years, but so I, I was part of that culture, but to see it in the entertainment business, to, in the, in my workplace 
was so bizarre, but also wonderful at the same time. And we have that at Lipscomb now too. I know Tony and I really appreciate that we work at a Christian school where we can share, we're, we're encouraged to share our faith and to talk to our students about this other side and not keep everything so, you know, in, in their boxes. Okay. Here's me talking about my art career and it's all about business and I don't know, money and sort of creativity, <laughs> but you know, and then, but here's me as a believer and that's a secret private thing that you're never going to know about, you know? So I love that we could be full humans, you know, in our lives. Yeah. Well, it's been a delight talking with both of you, Tom, Tony. We're grateful for your time and appreciate it. Tony, if you've got a drawing going, I would love to get to get the drawing and stick it <laughs> stick it on the episode yeah. page. I'm, well, I'm, I'm already seen it. it. It's not coming out. He needs to do a little bit more work on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. pass it Tom, will go, Tom will revise it. Yeah, pass it yeah. by Tom. Let him revise I it. I have some notes. And then we'll stick it on the uh, episode page. And, nice. Uh, yeah. There but, you go. But thank you both. We've been talking to Tom. And Tony Bancroft, and uh, thank you both guys so much for your time today. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you, Lee. Yeah, thank you. Hey there, quick favor. We're conducting an audience survey. We would be really grateful if you could take just a few minutes and answer our survey. Please visit survey.prx.org slash no small endeavor. That's survey.prx.org slash no small endeavor. Would love it if you'd go take that survey today. Thanks. All right, thanks to all the stellar team that makes this show possible. Christy Bragg, Jacob Lewis, Sophie Byard, Tom Anderson, Kate Hayes, Mary Evelyn Brown, Carriot Harmon, Jason Cheesley, and Ellis Osborne, and our music director, Tim Lauer. Also, our thanks to the all-star Nashville band and musicians that loaded up the tour bus with us to head out to Houston for that special night. Gideon Klein, Tammy Rogers, Ethan Yojevitz, Josh Hunt, Sam Hunter, all under the direction of Tim Lauer. Our guest artists were Walker Burroughs and Ruby Monfu, and our production staff from Stonebrook Media, led by Phil Barnett, and all the good folks at the Lanier Learning Center in Houston. Our thanks to all of you for hosting us and for helping us stage this live event. Thanks for listening, and let's keep exploring what it means to live a good life together. No Small Endeavor is a production of PRX, Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studio. Oh.